Hi, I'm Mary Catherine from the Good Art Company in Fredericksburg, Texas. Welcome to Art Talk. Today I'm talking with artist Lane Johnson about what inspires him to paint a Texas hill country. Let's listen in. Yeah, we really we, we drove and drove the back roads all over from uh, past Lano, all around Blanco. We're just trying to find the things I look for are structure. And um, there's so much of that just right around Fredericksburg. And uh, the, the wonderful galleries that are here, when I walked into this gallery, we were actually looking to, you know, approach various galleries. Yeah. And, but this space is just, it's just wonderful. If you look around the, the stonework and the openness, some galleries, are, they seem very crammed close and you feel like you're looking at things, you know, at arm's length. Whereas if I'm doing a painting that big, mm -hmm. You need to step back a little bit sometimes because then it's going to go into a home yes. that is going to that's going to command attention. So and, and you, you couldn't do that when it's only five feet away. So. Exactly, and this being a historic building and the limestone is indigenous, a lot mm -hmm. of the homes resemble it. So it's easy for clients to imagine the painting in yes. their space. Yes, but it's a beautiful space, and you're wonderful. Oh. <laughs> No, we, we really enjoy uh, the relationship that we have with you because... Well, I jumped the gun. You didn't even approach a gallery. I saw your work on Instagram and... and social media is wonderful. Sent you a uh, message. It sent me a message <laughs> and I said, yeah. So we actually moved paintings uh, and brought you new work. And I, I, I asked Sandra again, I brought just recently brought a, a new painting and I asked Sandra before we came, it's like, well, what happens if this one sells like that? And she goes, well, dude, that's a horrible problem. <laughs> to paint another we one. want that problem. Yeah, yes. yeah. And sometimes yes. we run into that here sometimes, and there. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the last time or the time before that, it's like, well, I brought a painting, and then the one that was here sold, and the one I brought sold within a few mm -hmm. days. And it's like, oh, I got to get, I got more hands. I need more hands and more time. But no, it's, it's, I love, I mean, I've got paintings scheduled that I want to paint and that I know I want to paint and yeah. uh, you were talking about the fiery one while well, I did a commission that was a very uh, again I love doing it because uh, it's just a different animal it's a different animal than the big oh, cloud yeah. like that Absolutely. and so uh, and there was so much detail in it personal detail you were mm -hmm. able to implement for the client yes that was another that's an interesting thing about commissions because sometimes clients have uh, little requests. They don't necessarily want to, and uh, they don't want to mess up your creativity. Yeah. So they want you. They don't want to uh, add all the various things that will kill your creativity. And uh, that was one big difference between the illustration, mm -hmm. commercial illustration, I should say. I did that before I did children's books. Okay. Uh, and so it was a project by project thing. So you didn't have a real narrative story to tell. So it was maybe more for advertising and marketing? Advertising, okay. marketing, co corporate, but they would very, they would say, we need this, 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 all these things. And so you, you were basically just doing it. Can you name some of the products you created logos or advertisements for? Are you able to do that? Uh, <laughs> well, let's just say I've done posters for, I don't remember the theater company, the big one in, in Houston. Uh, and, but I, one was South Pacific with Robert Goulet back then. Okay. And uh, so I spoke to Robert Goulet, oh. baritone, and, and uh, actually could not get the, photo, the photographs that I wanted of, of him. He was actually was, had the flu at the time. Oh. And so uh, I actually posed myself in the, the uh, jungle costume of South Pacific, and I just put his head on my body. And <laughs> so I'm singing in South Pacific. And another one was uh, uh, um, Camelot. Okay. And as odd thing is, uh, that was Richard Harris as King Arthur, okay. and I, the the painting I did had is designed a certain way, and it had mm -hmm. Guinevere and Matt Slot, and then in one a little diamond shape it had uh, Merlin. Okay. And the funny thing is, Merlin looks exactly like Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> so we got Richard Harris, and then Dumbledore right there. So yeah. that that said, uh, that was that was a fun thing, and uh, I did. The ecto cooler advertising uh, with uh, you know the Slimer from Ghostbusters. Okay. So it's like 
and yeah. you know, a lot of things over the years, but it was nice to get into children's books, and it's nice to get back to my, this is my true roots, this is the way I started. Yeah. Uh, and it's nice to, uh, the smell of linseed is, uh, there's, there's certain scents that bring back uh, certain memories for me. And okay. that's probably true of a lot of people. It, it is true. Um, just, my mom was an artist, and if I didn't smell like a lacquer, I smell a lacquer smell and I think of her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was back before, um, in the 80s. So. Yeah. They, didn't, um, they didn't have all the knowledge out there how bad that is, you know. Yes. Now, now to inhale a lot of artists now are wearing respiratory masks. Yeah, and, well I changed, um, I recently changed because that's one thing that I was dealing with. I was painting so much more, mm -hmm. and I'm going, I'm having headaches like crazy, so I was using a certain product that everybody uses. Yeah. It's a, considered an OMS, an odorless mineral spirit. Okay. But I was having headaches, and finally, I said, I've got to try something different. And so, after some research, I found Chelsea Classic Studios. But so, say, it smells like lavender. It's, it's lavender. like, it's, um, it, it doesn't have, a, it's a real lavender smell. I mean, yeah. this is lavender country, if, I can If you go into my studio, you're going to smell. Lavender smell and a real, like, yeah, it it's smells beautiful. beautiful. And headaches are mm -hmm. gone, so that that's was, nice. so that's what most people don't realize, if you're painting in oils, it's not the oil paint that's bad for mm -hmm. you. I mean, obviously there are certain colors that are heavy metal colors okay. that you should use caution with. Uh, you know, you don't rub them all over your hands, you know. I'll see artists wear gloves sometimes. Yes, yeah. but if you, choose, if you get some on your hands, just wash your hands real quick, you know, not yeah. a big deal. Uh, but I mean, like Van Gogh, he, he had all the issues he had back in those days. They didn't understand all this stuff. So he'd be rinsing his brush and he would always lick, lick it. it. Yeah. And so they, the big thing back then was lead. And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of things have been taken out of paint, but there are certain colors that are the cadmium reds and yellows yeah. that are hard to find a match for. They're just, they're just so beautiful. And just use common sense, you know, mm -hmm. don't put on your skin, don't lick at the brush. Exactly. Things like that. But so, but, but most people don't realize oils, is, it's all pretty much vegetable, you know, it's organic stuff. It's not okay. petroleum things. That's why you can take it on an airplane. You can't take your mineral spirits in the airplane, but the oil paints, you have you have a little label that says this is what this is, and they, you, they see it, and okay. they say, okay, it's another yeah. thing. But uh, most people think, well, oils are toxic and everything. It's like, no, well, it's the thing that you rinse your brushes with that typically will give you headaches or is a problem. Like turpentine is yeah. really strong. It's not, it's not uh, necessarily petroleum base is more natural, mm -hmm. but it's still a very strong scent. So I mean, when you're talking about getting, going through that airport with art, it brought back a memory. And uh, my husband, Brandon and I, we went to France and mm -hmm. I delivered a glass art piece wow. to, um, she had been, she had been to Texas for, that's how we met. And her name was Gwendolyn. And so I took it with me on the plane. Like we had it foam, we had it, you know, and I had a little handle made on the box and yeah. so we could, you know, tote it and it, it was gonna go in the above in storage and they had to unwrap it. Yeah. <laughs> they needed all my careful packaging. It had peanuts, they were going everywhere. They were laughing the whole time. They're like, we're pretty sure it is what you say it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we need to, because it's this big disc thing. I, and I <laughs> had a thing similar, very, very different happened back when I was doing children's art again. Uh, I did work for a publisher that does Highlights Magazine. You remember? The, oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was an 80s child, remember? I yeah. grew up on those. My great grandmother had a subscription. I did cover for the Highlights stickers. once. And, oh, really? But uh, I did more of the publishing arm of. The, the company for children's books. Okay. So, uh, but every year they would have a big party for all the artists. Okay. All you had to do is get there. So they'd pick you up from the airport, but uh -huh. over the weekend there'd be a big hoedown, a square dance thing, <laughs> but there'd be a costume uh, party. Okay. And so each year they had a different theme. And the one year I went as Curious George. <laughs> so before that, I had built a giant ceramic, what was it, paper mache, it, okay. it was heavy. And, but it looked just like Curious Stories. I was wearing my brown outfit. Oh, I bet people go wild at these parties. That's so I, I put it on the head. It sounded like I was Darth Vader on the inside. <laughs> but the, the thing was, I had to take, I had to get on the airplane. And so it was all wrapped up, and they, they you know, runs through the X-ray, and they go, "Okay, we're gonna have to open this up. What is this?" Yeah. And so they open it all up, and I says, "It's my hand." And I put it on. So, okay, <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> you might be on a random list of. Some yeah, watch this guy. Employees, like strangest <laughs> things they've seen come through the airport. <laughs>
but yeah, uh, it's very different now. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Well, um, let's yeah. see, I'm trying to think. We, you had talked about your favorite, or at one time I think you talked about some of your favorite artists that really influenced you. Uh, of course, N.C. Wyeth was one. Uh, I've always loved, you know, people, they talk about being an illustrator, going from an illustration to fine art. And it's, it's so funny because if you think about it, all the famous painters from the past were illustrators. Yeah. They were telling stories. Uh, I mean, Rembrandt's The Night Watch, you know, is, is a fantastic story. There's lots of things. Uh, Caravaggio's were all narratives. Mm -hmm. And so it's really uh, not a big leap to go, for, you know, to paint that, uh, you know, for fine art now. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, I enjoyed. Uh, let's see, Frederick Church, all, all, any of the uh, the Hudson River School painters I really liked a lot. Um, Fitzhugh Lane was, uh, he painted maritime art, but again, he was a luminist. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, what draws me to the things I paint? And it depends on what I'm painting, but, you know, I will say light. You know, light is one of those things that, uh, for instance, the painting I'm currently showing on Instagram, it's at that magic hour. It's the yeah. last part of the day when things come alive or on fire. They're there and mm -hmm. they're gone. Yeah. And so being at that, I get goosebumps thinking yeah. about it. It's <laughs> that magic moment where you see this wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And that can be a landscape, that could be mm -hmm. the light on a person's face, that could be all different things. Uh, but the light brings you to, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be walking around and you'll say, oh, look at that. Yeah. And that's one of those things that catches your eye. But also around here, it's like the structure. The structure mm -hmm. of the hill country uh, is one of those things that when I'm mm -hmm. out looking for uh, locations to be painting, I will, I can see this, you can see that, and I'm going, like, oh, look at the rock formation right here, or look yeah. at these cactus right here. Yeah. And, the, and then the dichotomy, so if you've got these wonderful things like blue bonnets that are so delicate and everything, right next to a thorny cactus and this hard rock. So yeah. all these dichotomies that there are somehow harmonized to create this beautiful scene. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my big challenge, it seems like, in the last several paintings is, well, how many focal points can I put into a painting? Because mm -hmm. uh, there are a limit to how many things you can sure. do. So uh, that's one thing I've discovered is I don't try to stop myself along the way and make sure I'm doing, you know, I, I create my yeah. own painting and I do it. You don't have this checklist, like got the deer, got the cat. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I keep going, because especially on a large painting, you can you can handcuff yourself. You know you've got to block things in, keep going, keep going, and you will come back to whatever and fix, not fix, but uh, adjust something or mm -hmm. add the detail that's needed. But you've got to keep going through the painting, and then at the end, mm -hmm. you Actually, this is from like, children's books again. You know, my wife is very good. She's much more left brain than, than I am. But at you know, my children's books, in my old studio, I had a really large wall and it had all the spreads. I pretty much all worked in spreads. So there were big paintings that looked like there was, I, and my thing was, I wanted to do a painting for a book that will have text in it. You had to account for that. Okay. You had to do a painting that looked like it didn't have a hole that was left text. It was okay. natural. So yeah. the text not there, it looks like a beautiful painting still. But at the end of the book, getting ready to finish it, we would lay all these spreads out on the, these ledges that mm -hmm. I had. So you had an entire, you know, several months worth of work on the wall. And I, it's the same thing as if you're working on a regular painting is, you get towards the end and you go, well, how do I know when I'm done? Okay. And how do I know, and you do, you get on a, a large painting and suddenly you'll go, okay, now what do I need? What do I and the, this is the, I'm going to go back to children's books because what she would do is go along, and she's one of the best art directors you know that I can think of. But she'd go along and say, and I just had to write it down, fix this, adjust that, do this, do that, and you just write things down. This is very left brain, and then even a large painting, I'd do the same thing, and I go, okay, that, that, do that, do that, do that, do that. and then that's the things that you were seeing before, organized in a way so you could just. Get it done. Get it done. Yeah. Otherwise, you can sit around and go, oh, staring at it. Like, what's wrong? What's what do I need to add? Wrong. Is yeah. it done? Is yeah. it done? Mm -hmm. And I get that question a lot. How do you know when it's done? Yeah. And I tell them, well, pretty much when I deliver to the gallery, it's done. <laughs> so it's going to be yeah. done. Yeah. But it's all. This is something that every artist struggles with. It's sure. like, man, is it really finished? And uh, 
And uh, I don't know if you remember the one that I did that with Blue Bonnet sent it. It was, I, it was an old painting I'd done. I had written my teacher's name from Painting 101 on the back of the canvas. And that painting went through at least two or three incarnations of something until finally it's done. It's done. Until I get it back from my mother in law, so then I can work on this. <laughs> no, it's done. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, um, I know you, you have traveled quite a bit and visit um, lots of the art galleries and, and museums across the United States. Mm -hmm. If you were going to give, if we were ever able to travel again, if you were going to get oh, kind yeah. of a see the painting in person bucket list, so to speak, you know, something that is more powerful in person. Yeah, they always are. Um, uh, but for, for collectors, for artists, just mm -hmm. even people who may, might not know much about art, mm -hmm. where would you say they should go? It, well, if you are looking for representational art, there are certain places. And then if you're looking for abstract art or expressionist art, there are other places. MoMA would be for yeah. things that are non-representational. Uh, uh, the Metropolitan is where you need to go in New York. And there's other ones too, because sure. these will be paintings that you would see uh, from art history in your but class. But you can go like, you need like a week. It's oh, like, yes, you yeah. do. And, uh, but the, at the Cowboy Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma City, they have a museum there. This this beautiful work. Again, it's very large scale things, but yeah, mm -hmm. like at the Met, you'll see paintings that you had no idea of the scale that they were, and you see it up close, and it's like, yeah. oh my god, and they're perfectly lit, and the, it puts the context to the things you might have learned about or seen before. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about detail, I know a lot of artists will use those big magnifying glasses mm -hmm. sometimes with the light. Mm -hmm. Do you use that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My eyes have changed over the years. I mean, uh, used to, I could get very close and with just glasses get, I just don't paint those kind of things as much anymore. I'd rather give the impression of detail yeah. than minutia. I mean, like if I'm doing like one of the trees I'm working on right now, I've had all these texture brushes that give me a certain thing and I've, I'm, I'm painting layers so I can go back and forth with highlights and darks and midtones. But at a certain point, you go along in certain places of that tree, and you add those doo -doo -doo, the yeah. little things, and the people go, detail! And then they think it's detail everywhere, but it's really not. And, and It does feel like that. It feels like there's detail from top to bottom. Yeah, it's, you, it's, yeah. you want to concentrate on moving the viewer's eye through the painting. And if you've got detail everywhere, then where's your eye supposed to look? It's more like a what, pattern. Then. Yeah. I mean, like, like we were talking about, I was doing uh, children's books, and the thing I always loved about children's books was that I was telling a story. Yeah. Most people don't know that when you are uh, doing work for a publisher, mm -hmm. an author may write the story, and then they get the artist to, to paint the story. And uh, the best thing is if you're the author and the illustrator are the same person, because you keep all the money. But, yeah. <laughs> but usually, you know, yeah. the author, and, but, and the thing is, the author's written, the story is very personal to them. Yeah. And they are thinking, this is my story. You've got to create their vision. And this is what a publisher is really good about. They will separate, there's a buffer, they're the buffer. You have an editor, an art director, buffering between the two. And so, and, and there's a good reason for it. For one thing, a publisher will choose, oftentimes, an artist mm -hmm. that will, be completely different. It will it will complement the story, okay. whereas the author may go, well, I want so and so, and that they may like the artist, yeah. but they don't really go with their story. Uh, I've had a lot of people contact me via emails like, I've gotten this, I've got this story, and they just send it, yeah. which is kind of a no no. Yeah. But uh, I'm curious, and so I start reading, and I'm going, this is really good. But I'm not the guy to do this. Yeah. You need somebody that can do whimsical cartoon type things for this. 30%. So the author is not always good at matching art to their okay. to their story. But the, the, what I was getting at is that it's very personal for them. Yeah. And what most people don't know is that once the publisher hires the artist to do that, that's half of the, that's their half of the book. So they own half the book at that point, the, the art I is. And so the author is going, uh, well, you know, but no, no, I want you to, no. Well, is there an author that you like to work with the most oh, in your career, oh, or yeah. is that like you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings? Well, <laughs> no, no, no. I've been blessed to have very good yeah. authors to work with throughout my uh, career. I, I did it for 15 years, yeah. and 
the thing is, as I went further into my career, I gravitated towards certain topics of the book, which were more uh, historical or historical nonfiction type things, which really interested me. The things that I would be able to go off and, you know, if I'm doing a book about Pearl Harbor, I went to Pearl Harbor. I went to all those places. If I'm doing about about George Washington, I went to Mount Vernon. I, I was I was had access to things that the okay. average person doesn't have access to. So almost like an actor gets into their character, yeah. you would immerse yeah. yourself in your subject matter so, uh, and yeah. like see it, feel it, experience it. I mean, I did little bunnies and I did little uh, kitty cats. But oh. when I was able to go, okay, I'm going to be doing a story about George Washington, not as a president, but as a farmer, and I'm going to be painting him from a young age, say like 29, till, his, till he passed away. Oh. So it's not only getting a likeness of George Washington, sure. but you have to imagine what he looked like and then carry the likeness throughout the age. Yeah. So th that's the skill set that you have as an as artist for children's books that you typically, people don't think about because the portfolio for that is, can you carry a likeness, number one? Can you carry that likeness from page to page, number two? And then the third wrinkle for that particular book was, can you do the same thing and have them age believably? So uh, yeah. that was very challenging and it was a lot of fun. Hmm. Was there ever a moment in, in your career um, working with books that you knew you wanted to eventually branch out as a canvas artist, as an oil painter? Oh, I, I always wanted to. Uh, part of it is the other half of doing children's books is a lot of fun because you visit schools. Okay. And my, my school visits were always very, you know, rambunctious. I would teach kids all these various things, how to draw things, yeah. but also I made sounds and things that were a lot of fun. But I would also flop on the floor. And at a certain point, I was getting older, I'm going, this is getting harder and harder to do. Yeah. And I kind of kept looking back and thinking, I really miss painting. At that point in my children's book career, I was painting oil paintings on canvas okay. still. So. I was, I really liked it, but a lot of things about the business part of it, I was getting kind of tired of, and it was changing. Things were becoming much more digital, and I didn't want to go that route. I wanted to remain a canvas painting artist, yes. and I, it's like, well, at, at that time, we were ready to maybe make a change in our life as well. We were, been, we were in the city, and both of us, my wife Sandra and, yes. and me, we both worked at home in my studio. She was actually in my studio. Uh, she had her spot where she did her work from home. So uh, it, it, we, we just realized, it's like, why are we still here? We yeah. don't have, we actually own property in Texas that we plan to retire to. It's like, why are we still here now? We don't have to wait for retirement. We can go, you know, build a new house and, and I could have a, maybe built a really dream studio yeah. and live the life, don't wait until I'm 65 yeah. and, and get there sooner. And so that was the point where I was like, I, I want to, take the leap of faith and yeah. go the route I want to go. And the funny thing is, I, the first things that I were painting were portraits. Yeah, I, I been, remember that. I were painting They're lots of people through all the books. My son has been in several books, children's oh. books. So the, the Pony Express book, he's on the cover of that. And he's one of the, at the time he was 21. <laughs> so I painted him probably from age five or six to at least 21, the, average, the age of a Pony Express writer. Yeah. And so, uh, He's, you can could, you could see his growth through the years in, in picture books. And, that's, uh, that's, really, that's really sweet, like a really sweet devotion. Well, we, you know, you don't really think about it until you look back and go, oh. <laughs> I didn't have always all the best photographs of my son necessarily, but I painted yeah. a lot of paintings. Yeah. yeah. So uh, at, at any rate, I was ready to look forward, and I started doing portraits. And then finally my wife, Sandra, said, well, Lane, what do you want to do? because I was still trying to feel my way down the path of where I wanted to go. And uh, I was actually taking old paintings and reworking them. And she said, you start painting something fresh. Find something that, find a thing that you really like. And that's where the Texas Hill Country came in. Because I was used to East Texas like this, sure. where you have pine trees and you know, old roads and things like that. But I knew the Hill Country had structure. It had cactus, it had rock formations, it had, different textures than I was used to. And I Rivers really, and, yeah. Very different, very different uh, everything. And so we began exploring. But she, she had asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, landscapes. That's what I enjoy doing. Yeah. And then she said, well, you should do that. So yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> well, was I that think, easy. I think that was a really uh, good decision. <laughs> but yeah, we got up here and really explored. We've, we've been through so many back roads. We found certain places that we really like. 
Well, yeah. a lot of clients have had you out to the properties, mm-hmm. and, and so you really got to, again, you're, you're kind of repeating how you were with books, because you did a, stayed out there, saw the sunrise, saw the sunset, yeah. walked the land, really got a feel for it. And watch out for deer. Yes. Oh, my goodness. There are deer everywhere. Well, right now, rattlesnakes, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> This morning, I was getting out, and uh, I, we had been to a location uh, earlier in the year. It's still winter time, so the foliage wasn't really doing anything yet. But we found a location that had this waterfall. I go, oh, I've got to come back here, and so I knew. And of course, the, the COVID things happened, and it messed up blue bonnet season totally. So uh, strangely enough, where we were. Uh, Yesterday, I think it was. Mm-hmm. There were still a lot of blue bonnets. There were still some but uh, the typical place, like Willow City Loop. Mm-hmm. No, they're all gone. They're, cool. they're just kind of a fading yeah, color. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But even the white poppies that we saw last year, didn't see them. It's not a real strong wildflower season. I'm not, I'm not sure why. But you know what? I can paint them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know true. where they are. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, the one of the locations that, uh, like uh, this, this painting here, mm-hmm. that location, uh, it had a lot of uh, blue bumps around there, and, and it's like, wow! I didn't, you know, didn't know if I was. I, if you put some blue bumps in the painting, you have to make sure you're painting in the right season. Yeah. Because trees are doing a certain thing. It's true. And uh, you'll have some live oaks that are already leafing out really well. Others are not. They're putting mm-hmm. on little tassel things. So you have to paint. You know, in my mind, you have to because my background. I, if if you were doing working on a book that was not fiction. You never wanted to have somebody come back and say, well, that's not right. Those trees don't want to That is a match. Actually, you know, um, there in Bernie, um, I was on a, I was a, a judge on a panel for the Nature Preserve. Mm-hmm. And um, it was kind of an interesting setup where artists would pair up with landowners and mm-hmm. then they had to visit the property at least twice in a year mm-hmm. and do two, two paintings to enter into the show. Well, one of the judges worked for the state of Texas for the wildlife, uh, I can't remember the department, but, but he knew everything native. He was there. Yeah. He would say, that tree, yeah. wrong season, those those geese, yes. those geese aren't even from here. Like, you know, it was obviously an imagined uh, well, you, painting, you know, and he could eliminate some of the artists that, even though their paintings were good, the whole goal right. was to actually yeah. capture the land that they were um, yes. on. So, do, you, do you remember the painting that it was recently the diptych that I did, and yeah. they bought a, they bought a painting that they really liked, and they came back with one another one to go with it, mm-hmm. and then I was asking, well, how much how much with it? You want to just hang them side by side, or yeah. or do you want them to be kind of like a diptych? And for those of you that don't don't know what a diptych is, it's basically where you have a painting next to another painting, but the whole overall thing reads as one painting. And you can have a diptych mm-hmm. or a triptych or quadriptych. Yeah. It could go on and on, but they have to work together. Mm-hmm. And the only problem was the first painting that I did, and of course, if you're doing a diptych, you should plan them together to begin with. Yes. But after the fact, was like, oh, this is challenging. It's kind of like I think a remodel. It. It's like a remodel. <laughs> so I was looking at the painting, and the thing is, they wanted a few details in the painting, and one of them was a, a white-tailed buck deer with horns. Okay. And I'm like, that well, <laughs> that means the season has to be this. And it mean, that means this first painting needs some little alterations on it. And they were fine with doing that, and it, turned out, it turned out well. I like, I, I like the diptych um, uh, personally because in, for interior design purposes, you can flank them on the mm-hmm. either side, or if you need one big piece later on, you can arrange it. Just, it's a, well, I, I so really, much more versatile. I, I really like to challenge myself. So I did, did that, and I thought it really matched well, but I did it in a way that well, you can put them side by side like this. Mm-hmm. Or you can put them side by side like that. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. And you can, they'll still was, match yeah. and, and go, wow, that worked out well. That's, yeah. Do I, what I want to do every day? Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was fun challenge. So. Yeah. Well, I know um, your next uh, piece that you're planning down the road, I think you have a custom, is that real fiery sky. Mm-hmm. Where did you... Um... We visited there yesterday, and so we saw uh, all the things. That was actually the same location as the waterfall, but the waterfall was down the... This is uh, Threadgill Creek. Down the way, it's a little way, looking the other direction, uh, and the way I'm painting the other, the fiery one will be, you know, as the sunset would be. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's so funny. You revisit these locations, 
and you go, oh, that's different here. Look how much this has gone up. Look at how this has changed. And that's really the way, I've got a painting plan in the future that's got a, a horseback rider, a, a, this will be vintage kind of thing, okay. where he's finding his way along the creek. And the mindset is, again, I'm a storyteller. The mindset is, this is the trail. Yeah. I know where things are, but it's different. Something's, something's changed now. Yeah. I have to deal with a different thing. You know, well, here it's like, well, you get rainfall, especially heavy rainfall, that creek can turn into something oh, completely yeah. different. Absolutely. And then when there's drought, it, it dries up and it becomes something structurally different again. So it's a challenge to see the same exact location under different conditions, under different times, you know, go with a different time of day, different season. Yeah. It's just, it's so much here to, to explore. It's true. Right now, I think it's the year of the cactus too. Yeah, well, it's beautiful cactus. Beautiful um, flowers and blossoms. I see everything from, right now, a lot of yellow, but I've seen some deep magenta. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. think you're going to implement any of the of that into some future painting? Oh, definitely. Because it's totally different this year. I don't think you've seen it as cactusy and 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 so the, full of, of floral.